Well, amen. How great is our God this morning. He has given us life itself. And we are here today only by His grace. And so we're so thankful and so grateful to our Heavenly Father who loves us, who made Himself available to us through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that we have become members of the family of God. Welcome to Freedom Church on this glorious, cold first Sunday in February. And this is our anniversary day as the people of God here in this place. And so we have been a body of believers for 19 years. So this is our 19th anniversary. And I'm so grateful that we can spend it together as the people of God here in this place. I want us to spend a few minutes this morning thinking about those that we need to be praying for. I have two very specific requests this morning that I would like to share with you. Uh, over the course of the last several days, three churches, two of which are uh, pastored by colleagues of mine at the Bible College, and another one that I was interim pastor of, had to close their doors because of COVID this week. And because of decisions that people made caused them to have to do that. And so they're going to be uh, quarantined for a period of time before they're going to be able to go back into having on-campus worship experiences. So uh, we certainly need to be praying for those bodies of believers round about us who because of issues that have arisen related to COVID that they're unable to come together as the people of God in worship there in that particular place. Then yesterday, uh, a young man who was uh, a student at the Bible College when I was, lo some 35, more than 35 years ago, uh, succumbed to COVID yesterday and went home to be with Jesus. Before he came to Clear Creek Baptist Bible College, he was the sheriff in Floyd County. And um, I would ask that you would pray for uh, Brother Doug's family. Doug Lewis is his name, and uh, he's gone on to be with Jesus. But certainly remember his family, the Doug Lewis family, as uh, the home going of Brother Doug related to COVID just yesterday. So we're still in the midst of this, and I don't enjoy it any more than you do. But we need to be diligent. We need to be persevering in faith, recognizing that God will get us through this situation and those that we're encountering over the next number of weeks. Do you have prayer requests you'd like to share with us this morning? Something on your heart? Amen. Thank you. We'll certainly pray for uh, Brother Marty's father and his family as well, your brothers and sisters as well. Thank you, sir. Something else? Okay. Chad has a test. We'll certainly pray for you, for you Brother Chad. Thank you for that. Something else? Miss Sharon, we're certainly glad you're back. Glad to see you this morning sitting next to your dear husband. Something else. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Miss Sharon. Appreciate that testimony. Something else on your heart this morning. You know, God has called us to be intercessors. He's called us to be a people of prayer. He's called us to reach out to Him so that we might intercede because He has called us to be a kingdom of priests. And so having been called to be a kingdom of priests, we recognize that the role of the priest, or the role of a priest, is to mediate between God and man. So 
the children of God in the world today are to be praying for those who are not only outside the family of God, but those within the context of the family of God who have needs that need to be prayed for. So you and I have a tremendous opportunity, a tremendous responsibility as well to be interceding on behalf of those around about us today. Something else on your heart before we pray together as the family of God in this place. Well, let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have made that we can rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you that you have called us out as the people of God, and you have made us your ecclesia, your called out ones, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in this particular place. We thank you for your continued ministry to us, even in the midst of these things that are going on around about us. We thank you that you are accessible to us through prayer and that you have called us to come into your presence and in your presence find help in time of need. Father, we recognize not only are there needs in the midst of this family, not only are there needs in the midst of this congregation, but we recognize that in our extended family there are needs. And certainly within the context of our community there are needs. And certainly in our state and in our nation and in our world we recognize needs all around us. And Father, we just glory in the fact that you are sovereign over all the universe. And you know what's going on in the lives of each and every individual. And so we recognize you as the great needs-meeting God today. And so we declare today our love to you. We declare to you that you are worthy to be praised and that just as our praise team sang, you are a great God. You are not only a great God, you are the great God. And we choose by a definitive act of our wills to worship you. And so today you've brought us to this place, Father. And so we give ourselves to you so that you might be glorified here in this place and that you might lead us into the truths of your word that would make a difference in our lives. And so we express to you today, Heavenly Father, thanks for being our God. And thanks for grace in our lives and life today. And Father, we pray that you would lead us into all righteousness and that we might make a difference where you have planted us. So today, Father, we love you. We honor you. We choose to witness for you in our world. Lead us through this worship experience. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. This morning we're going to do just a couple of things differently. In fact, first of all, we're going to look at a short video from Cuba, from some of our brothers and sisters in Christ in Cuba, so that uh, they might be able to express their gratitude to us in the midst of our anniversary day. Then, once we move our way through that video, I'm going to read to you a portion of the initial history of the Freedom Baptist Church, just to re-remind us of what took place some 19 years ago. And then in addition to that, um,
Brother Kenny's going to be putting some pictures on the wall behind me in front of you to remind you of those early days as well. So I just encourage you to watch and to listen and to reflect this morning on those early, early days of our life as a body of believers here in this place. Hello, Freedom. Hello again. Hello from Cuba. We are here in this beautiful place. Enjoy it with the sun and the wind. And we know that you are celebrating your anniversary. Queremos invitarles que vengan a Cuba. We want to invite you to come to Cuba. Aquí en Cuba. Esto es un lugar que podemos dar testimonio a las personas. In Cuba, this is a place we can give testimony to people. Aquí en Malé, Malecón. And these three clowns. Tienen los, los, los jóvenes. The youth come here. Las parejas. Couples come here. A pasar un tiempo. To spend a, a nice time. En los parques se juega fútbol. And in the parks they play soccer. Y podemos dar testimonio con ellos. And we can give testimonies and share with them. Ellos the necesitan oír el evangelio. They need to listen to the gospel. Y ustedes pueden extender el evangelio aquí también. And you can expand Así the gospel invito. here. So we invite you here. Les felicito por su aniversario. And I congratulate you on your Gracias. anniversary. God bless you. And we wait. Que seguir junto orando y extendiendo el reino de Dios. Together and in the you. kingdom of God. Amen. God bless Amen. you. God bless you. Happy, 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 happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Amen. Isn't it good to know that there are those in our world who uh, love us and care for us and want to celebrate with us in the midst of our anniversary? I was fortunate enough to uh, be given the... Uh, Freedom Baptist Church history that was written by Miss Jerry. And so what I'd like to do this morning is just to read to you out of this document the first couple of years of the life of Freedom Baptist Church. This history begins by telling us that on January 26, 2002, about 56 people left Palestine Baptist Church along with the pastor, and began a new work in order to worship and praise the Lord and begin to reach out to Campbellsville's lost and hurting people. We met at the Campbellsville Health and Fitness Center. There was a 50-50 split from Palestine Church. And those of us who keenly sensed God's direction in doing ministry under the leadership of Pastor Larry Frisbee, determined to begin a new church that would allow us to reach out to, to the people in Campbellsville and to win people to Christ and to minister to those in need and worship freely as we chose to do. We met at the Health and Fitness Center for a period of two months. An agreement was reached in that time frame by the Finance Committee and Deacon Body at Palestine Church. They would give six months severance pay to Brother Frisbee, and he was to be paid in installments if he agreed to resign as pastor there. It was agreed upon unanimously to accept the offer. We met and discussed the names for the new church and decided upon Freedom Baptist Church. We began to plan and to seek a more permanent place of worship while we continue to meet in the uh, fitness center. The center is owned by our members, Kenny and Susan Phillips. We met Wednesday evenings at the pastor's home during those days. On February the 3rd, 2002, there were 54 present and nine visitors. We had an offering of $3,622.62. On Monday, February the 4th, a more permanent place of worship was found. A five-year lease was signed on the old security, Social Security building at 111 West Main Street in Campbellsville. 
a crew of our members began to work to make the new church home ready for use. At first look, we had a big, empty, dirty building. There was cleaning to be done, such as cleaning, sweeping, light fixtures, bathroom, junk room, and picking up by hand what seemed like thousands of staples from the floor. A platform was built by some of the men for the pastor to preach from. While this was being done, others set about to get the utilities turned on. Our new church home was ready for use February the 6th. We transported folding chairs loaned to us by the fitness center until we were able to purchase our own. There were people appointed to see to the legalities and paperwork necessary for us to become incorporated. And on Sunday, March 3rd, 2002, one month after starting our new church, we began Sunday school for all ages. The only child we had to begin with was Travis Gabehart, the son of Todd Gabehart. After that, Jeannie Cox came with her three children. We had purchased our own folding chairs and tables. Some tables were built by Frankie Graham for the children's department. We purchased all of our materials and a sound system. The men built a sound system and boxed it in. We also secured a PowerPoint presentation apparatus. We still had funds to pay our rent once those were done. Dr. Sanders, who along with his son, owned the building, and he died at age 91, a short time after we moved in. A piano was loaned to us by our member Pauline Smith for as long as we needed it. On March 24, 2002, we observed as the family of God our first Lord's Supper. Eventually, a communion table was secured by a member, Larry Bosley. The place he worked built and donated that table. The work continued on the building. A kitchen area was made functional. There were sinks installed, and we had hot water. A stove and a refrigerator were donated to us. Many hours of work by many dedicated people to make our new home better for the Lord's work. We continued to have visitors, and offerings were good. We observed our first Annie Armstrong offering in March and received $594.25. Our spring revival was led by Dr. Jerry Burgess of Whitley City, Kentucky, and was well attended with two professions of faith made. There were 70 in attendance on Mother's Day. Also in May, we held our first mother-daughter banquet. On May 26, 2002, we baptized two people at Green River Lake. We joined another church for a pig roast at Lone Oak Pavilion and fellowshiped together. Our first wedding took place June 1, 2002. The daughter of one of our members, Deanne Wilder and Roy Darst, were married by our pastor. Our members' parents are Kenneth Jones Sr. and Dorothy Jones. There was a wedding shower for and a reception held for Bethany and Chad Shively in June as well. The first anniversary celebration was held June 16th, and the 50th anniversary for Charles and Lois Melton was observed. On June 23rd, we held a commissioning service at Freedom for a medical mission trip to Jamaica. And two of our members, Amber Phillips and Luann Calms, participated as well as Diana, as Dana Cock, who went as well. We had a special offering to help with that trip and received $541. Two mission teams came in June to put on a drama called Judgment House. Where will you spend eternity? We had about 400 people come through the doors to see this in four days. There were a total of 76 people who stated they had accepted Christ and many dedications and other decisions were made. To date, over 2,000 door hangers 
to invite people to the Lord and to our church had been hung. One family has come as a direct result of that. June also had two backyard Bible clubs, and as a result, two accepted the Lord as personal Savior. They are awaiting baptism now and wish to join the church. Our children's department is growing rapidly in Sunday school. We have a mixed class of about 25 people, a ladies' class of between 8 and 9 enrolled, and a men's class of 3 and 4 enrolled. On Friday, August 16th, the first one of our members went home to be with the Lord, Ken Jones Sr., a very faithful man. We continue to grow in fellowship, and the fellowship is sweet at Freedom Baptist Church. On August 18, 2002, we constituted as a church, and Ken Jones Sr. was made an honorary charter member. We had a Friends Day on September 22nd and had about 130 people present, including our mayor, Eddie Rogers, and his wife. And we had a Friend Day meal after the morning service. A new ministry has now been added. This is a ministry to senior adults. A meal on one Wednesday per month, prepared and served by our younger members of the church. On October 5th, 2002, Jerry and Will Stevens celebrated their 50th anniversary with recommitment of their wedding vows and a reception afterwards. This was given by their children with help by some of the ladies from the church. Brother Frisbee performed the ceremony. Saturday, October 26, 2002, saw the first women's event held at Freedom Church. Wanda Dobbins, a counselor with Cornerstone Counseling was guest speaker, and Debbie Placenti provided special music and led the praise and worship time. Teresa Davis, a new member, also sang a solo. We had breakout conferences led by Virginia Flanagan, the director of the Technology Center at Campbellsville University, Mary Reynolds, director of the Pregnancy Support Center, and our pastor's wife, Miriam Frisbee, certified dietitian. There were a good number of guests as well as our own ladies, and lunch was served. In November, on Tuesday the 12th, Freedom Baptist Church was officially accepted into the Kentucky Baptist Convention and recognized as a church. At Cumberland College in Williamsburg, at the annual meeting, and I in fact was at that meeting as well, Six members of Freedom Baptist attended and four served as messengers for our church. The six who went were Pastor Frisbee and Miss Miriam, Jerry and Will Stevens, Lois Melton and Ken Jones. Messengers were Jerry, Ken, Lois, and the pastor. The church provided 109 shoebox gifts to Samaritan's Purse and Operation Christmas, making a total of 776 shoeboxes from this area. We had a Thanksgiving meal the week before Thanksgiving, and many people attended, and the fellowship as well as the meal was wonderful. December 15th was a Sunday night sing-out, and some of our own members provided special music. The church was decorated with a nine-foot tree, bought by members and donating ornaments as well. Then on December 22nd, we had a Christmas program called I Wish You Jesus. With a play and music, the children and adults put it on. It was followed by a fellowship Christmas meal. January 10th and 11th, the team leaders and spouses, along with the pastor and his wife, went to a weekend retreat for the purpose of planning our vision for 2003 and beyond. Much was accomplished. And so as we think about and look at the history of this glorious place, what we recognize is that God was in this from the beginning and that it was by His grace that we are here in this place today. 
and that uh, I have had the story told to me that um, we were told that uh, there could never be a church building on this piece of property. And God proved that wrong. And He placed us here for a reason. And just as we had a reason for beginning, we have a reason for continuing as well. And that as you could see, even over the reading of that initial history, that good things were taking place at the beginning of Freedom Church. And you know what? Good things continue to take place. And that God's not done with us by a long shot. And that there are so many more things that He wants to do both in us and through us, not only to this community, but to all over this world as we continue to minister to indigenous people groups through missionaries. And that where those missionaries are, we are too as Freedom Baptist Church. And that we are able to minister to them through this body of believers. And that our own former pastor is involved in missions in Cuba. And that uh, just as we had this group of Cubans who celebrate with us, and we saw that in the context of that short video, we recognize that God wants to do a work there in that place as well. And that we, as the people who call themselves Freedom Church, are involved in that ministry as well. And as we pray for them, we recognize that God has richly blessed us as the people here in this place. And that because we have been blessed, we are able to bless others also. So I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be a part of this fellowship. I'm glad to be part of this family. And I'm glad that there was foresight on the part of a group of individuals our former pastor and his wife, at the beginning of this process 19 years ago to do something that would make a difference in Campbellsville and Taylor County. And we are most blessed from them because of what we have here together today. But I believe that God wants to do exceedingly abundantly above anything that we've ever asked or thought as it relates to our direction in the future. And I am so excited that God has chosen by a definitive act of His will to use us and to continue to use us as well. Let's pray for our church this morning. Let's pray for our church family this morning as well. Brother Larry, would you pray for us this morning? Thank you, Brother Larry. Appreciate that. If you have your Bible this morning, we're going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We have begun a series of messages that we have entitled, Love is the Only Way to Discipleship. Love is the Only Way. And so we have looked up to this point at some of those things that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has said to us in the context of the Gospels 
about what it means to love and how we have an obligation and a responsibility to be not only loving, but to be obedient unto the will of Almighty God as well. You remember from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48, that the Word of God declares that we're to love our enemies and to do good to those who would spitefully use us and to bless and not to curse. And then we talked about John chapter 15, recognizing that Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. And so we recognize, as the people of God in this place, who have been called to be mathetes, That's the Greek word for disciple. We have been called to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have begun to look at this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, recognizing that it's bookend between two chapters, 12 and 14, that both talk about spiritual gifts. We would understand the significance of spiritual gifts as we look at those two chapters, but understand as well that the Apostle Paul tells us in the last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that spiritual gifts are good, but he wants to tell us of a more excellent way. And then he moves us into this passage that is typically within the context of the New Testament church today, used only in the context of weddings. It's about the only time we ever hear it. And yet what we know and understand is that that which the Apostle Paul, under the leadership of God's Holy Spirit, wrote to us in 1 Corinthians 13, is to become the pattern of your life and mine as a follower of Christ. And so we are to exemplify and manifest these characteristics that we discover here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And so last week I shared with you that there are 15 verbs within the context of verse 4 through verse Six that would help us, excuse me, through verse 7, that would help us see what we are to do as it relates to being a people of love. And so what I want to do as we, be, as we begin again today, I want to do as I have done for the last four Sundays as we've been in this series, I want to read 1 Corinthians 13 to us. Because the Word of God declares to us that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And that we need to hear God's Word as it relates to this idea of love. So I want to read that passage to us. And then I want to re-remind us of the two positive things that are said at the beginning of that list in verse 4. And that we've already looked at three of those negatively based eight verbs in the end of verse 4 and into verse 5, and then we'll move our attention into those truths that we've not looked at up to this point, and we'll go just as long as uh, time will allow. Listen to what Paul says under the leadership of God's Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. So in essence, what Paul is saying to us, that if we do those things and are able to speak in those kinds of tongues, and yet we do not exemplify love, we become noisemakers in our world, vying with all of the other makers of noise round about us as well. Verse 2 tells us, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. 
And though I bestow all of my goods to feed the poor, so even if I'm doing good things, bestow my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and choose to martyr myself, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So then when we move to chapter to verse 4, you would understand that Paul begins to lay forth for us these characteristics of love. What I would say and what I would call them is that when we begin to get to verse 4, we have the parameters of love established for us. That is to say that, that Paul, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, begins to set the boundaries of our love so that we might understand the significance of this love and how it should be put into practice in your life and in mine. Look what he says. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity. But rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. And love endures all things. And if you write in your Bible, I might encourage you there at the beginning of verse 8 that you might highlight that first phrase there in verse 8. Look what it says. Love never fails. And so you and I, functioning under the leadership of God's Holy Spirit and operating within the context of this agapeo, this agape love, need to understand that love that is self-sacrificing never fails. Then Paul goes on to say, but whether there are prophecies, they shall fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, and I, un and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly. But then, face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, love these three. But the greatest of these is love. And so as we move our attention to verses 4, 5, and 6 this morning, you would recognize that we've talked about the, the long-suffering nature of love. And we've talked about that love being patient and kind We've talked about it in the positive sense. And then it begins negatively to say, love does not envy, love does not parade itself, it is not puffed, puffed up. And then we get to verse 5. And this is where I want to begin our time together this morning looking at the text of Scripture. It says, love does not behave rudely. And so when we think of the term rudely in the Greek, we discover that the word literally means to behave disgracefully, dishonorably, or indecently. 
and that this agape love that we know only because we know the Lord Jesus Christ. And in First, excuse me, in First John chapter four, the Word of God declares to us that God is love, and the only way that we can know what this agapeo love is is to know Almighty God. And so when we look at what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary, we recognize that agape love is a self-sacrificing kind of love that Christ exemplified for us when he went to Calvary's cross in our place so that he might spill his precious blood and that that precious blood might become the atoning blood of the sacrifice for all sin of all mankind. And so when the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is applied to your life and mine, and we become members of the family of God, blood-bought, born again, transformed individuals, we recognize that we are not to behave rudely. And so you see a rude person is more concerned and is quite frankly consumed with their concern for themselves. And so everything that happens round about that person who is rude has to do with them, not with the other individual. And the Word of God declares to us that we're not to be like that. We're to be different. Because love isn't about me. And love isn't about my needs. Love is about other people. But the rude person would say, love's about me. Love's about my needs. Love is about what is mine. And what I want to keep. And so we understand from looking at this idea of love not being rude that that agapeo is not disgraceful. That agapeo is not indecent. That love that comes from God is a love that goes back to a part of our understanding of being made in the image of God. And having been made in the image of God, God made us relational. Don't believe that? God brought all the animals to Adam in chapter 2 of Genesis. And the Bible declares to us that, that God gave Adam the ability to name all the animals. And yet in Genesis chapter 2 it declares to us that in the midst of all those animals that were being named that Adam found no suitable helpmate. And so God then did surgery on Adam and took one of his ribs out of his side and then closed the skin back up where that rib was taken and with that rib he made Adam a suitable helpmate. And that suitable helpmate that, that God made for Adam was Eve. And so God made Adam, and then he made Eve because Adam had been made in the image of God, in the image of the Trinity, which is relational. And so we now see that we have been made relational beings. And because we have been made a relational being, you know how hard it's been? You... you You've lived through this COVID pandemic for a full year. I mean, it's hard because we don't get to see people we love. It's hard we don't get to be with people we love. And we're reminded constantly when we look at the news about people dying in hospitals with no family members present. 
and the toll that that's taking on those health care providers. And it's because we are relational individuals. And so God has called us to be a part of a family. And we need those people who comprise that family. Wednesday night, right here in this, in this very room, I left about 8.35, so about 35 minutes after we were done with the uh, pr presentation of the 34th Psalm, that there were still at least two families and even more than two families that were just enjoying each other's fellowship. Because we're made that way. Because we miss being with other people. And if we're rude and we only think of ourselves, then we're not fulfilling that relational component that God has made us in. Look what else this passage says to us there in verse um, 5 of chapter 13. Does not behave rudely. Love does not behave rudely. Then it says, love does not seek its own. So the word seeking its own carries with it the idea of someone being self-seeking as opposed to seeking the need of another. And that self-seeking is the epitome of selfishness. And so what we see here is that uh, the word seek means to try, strive for, to aim, to try to obtain, to desire, to wish for, or to demand. And so the person that seeks his own is far more concerned about themselves than they are about other people. And so the tense of the verb here in verse 5 indicates to us that this self-seeking individual becomes irritated and frustrated and angry because they are impatient with others, because they have an exalted view of themselves, and because they are fearful or have some pain in their lives. And so for the one who does not seek his own is one who is spending their time caring for others. You remember what Christ said? That, that scribe came to him and said, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second commandment is likened unto the first, that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And then he goes on to say, that on these two commandments hangs all of the Old Testament, all of the law and the prophets come forth out of those two individual and distinct commandments. So what we're seeing here by Paul written to a church that had more problems than you and I have ever had, and more situations arise that the Apostle Paul sought to deal with in the context of that body. He is telling them that love will overcome all of those problems. And that in your life and mine, that when we begin to love like we ought to, when we begin to love like the Lord Jesus Christ loves us, and we begin to 
appreciate people, recognizing that they might not ever love us back, that we love them because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. That we begin to understand that He loved us so that we might love other people as well. So look what else it says here. One more thing and then we'll be done this morning. Verse 5, it says, does not behave rudely, does not seek his own, is not provoked. So we understand this idea of irritability, thinks no evil. And the idea of thinks no evil there carries with it this idea of keeping score. You remember Peter said to Jesus, Lord, how often should I forgive? Seven times seven? And he thought he'd gone a long way by saying he was going to forgive. And Jesus said, no, seven times seventy. And the implication of that which Christ said to him was that we are not to keep score. We are to recognize that we have been forgiven. And having been forgiven, we are to so live as forgiven people that we forgive others. Also, Look what else it says here as we look at this. So, so the term in Greek that means think no evil carries with it the idea of to determine by mathematical calculation or to reckon. So it would be when someone does not meet an acceptable standard of behavior that the individual has set. And so we're keeping track of all those times they messed up, all those times they missed it, all those times that they did the wrong thing. And Paul tells us in this passage that love doesn't act that way. Because you see, what love does is that love cares about the individual and so cares about the individual that we don't keep score. So love doesn't keep track of what's been done to it. Love doesn't get angry quickly either. So we understand that we are to be a people who don't keep score. Because keeping score is a sign of someone who is immature, who's not attained that level that God expects them to attain so that they might be whom God has called them to be. So I share with you this morning that love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not irritable. And love does not keep score. So as we come to a time of invitation here this morning, I just want to ask you, would you be willing to assess your life based upon these four ideas, would you be willing to just ask God's Holy Spirit to begin to look at the deepest, darkest recesses of your heart and to see how you are living your life. And if you are living your life as a fully-fledged follower of Christ, a true mathetes, a true disciple, a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and that you would allow God's Holy Spirit to make whatever adjustments He may deem as being necessary for you so that you might exemplify the Lord Jesus Christ to your spouse, to your family, to those at school or at work, and that they might genuinely see that there's something different in you. You know, we've used that term transformation here on more than one occasion. You would understand that that, that, that word in the Greek is the word metamorphosi. And we get our term metamorphosis from that. And we would understand that it means the difference between a caterpillar and a butterfly. That a caterpillar is transformed into this glorious, beautiful, flying creature. So there was a change made. And the kind of change that that word talks about, and as we look at it in the context of the world in which we live, is that there was a dynamic change. Right? Caterpillar don't look nothing like, pardon me, don't look nothing like a butterfly. Does it? But I can tell the difference between a caterpillar and a butterfly, can't you? One crawls on the ground, the other one flies in the air. One is beautiful and one just is not so much. Yeah, that's a good way of putting that. It, it, it just um, is camouflaged so it looks like the ground around it. So it can be safe that way. So we recognize that when God does a work in our lives, it so changes us that we look different. And that Paul tells us in Romans 12 that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so even as we've come to know Christ, there is a renewing, a transformation that needs to take place as we move along that continuum of sanctification. Having been justified by His blood, we are now being matured into His image as we read and study about Him. In fact, that's one of the purposes for the proclamation of the Word from the pulpit is that we might be instructed and might be challenged and might learn what it means to be a follower of Christ to a greater degree than we've ever done before. Let's pray. Father God, we love you and praise you this morning. We thank you as we come to a time of invitation today that your blessed Holy Spirit might lead us into all truth. And as we look at this passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 13, that your Holy Spirit would begin to um, look at our lives and help us to eradicate anything that does not look like Jesus and replace that with his presence. And so we ask now today that your blessed Holy Spirit would begin that process within us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Now certainly in these times of pandemic, I want to give you an opportunity to make a decision. And what that means is that there's a decision today that you need to make that you have an opportunity and that I as the pastor have given you opportunity to come to this altar and pray or to make whatever decision change needs to be made there in your seat. And I would encourage you and those who are watching us by way of uh, this camera and media today, if uh, there are questions that you have as it relates to this passage or questions you have about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that you can communicate with us and we can answer all those questions that you have and that you can be transformed as well. So I'll just give you a minute right where we are for you to think about this change, this evaluation that needs to take place.
Father, thank You for transformation. Thank You for loving us. Thank You for being our God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There are no birthdays this morning. Kenny's already made me aware of that. Um, by announcement, uh, let me just share with you that we received a card from uh, Chuck and Sharon today, a thank you card, and um, the writing inside of it declares, we want to say thank you to our church family for your prayers, phone calls, and acts of kindness during our illness. You see, that's what family's about, ministering to the needs of each other, loving each other in the midst of where we are as members of the family of God. And isn't it so good that God in His grace and God in His mercy allowed us, even today, to come to this place to worship together in spirit and in truth and to be a part of the family of God here in this place. Happy birthday, Freedom Church. Happy anniversary, Freedom Church. What a blessing to be a part of this fellowship in these days. Chad, would you close us in a word of prayer?